Kevin, thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, thank you for having me, Doug. It's just always an honor and a privilege for me to be amongst greatness, and I consider you great, brother. Last time you were on with us, we didn't really get to talk a lot about this. I'd like to know a little bit about your personal journey with the Lord. How did you come to have a revelation of the work of the cross, power of the resurrection, and come to know the Lord? I was born in abject poverty in the 1960s. Uh, so I was born and in the first seven years of my life, I lived in the Hunter's Point Projects in San Francisco. So I had a two-parent household, but we were, you know, they were just trying to make it. So Hunter's Point was where I was born. So I get the abject poverty thing. Um, then we moved to a lower middle class uh, community after uh, when I was around seven. And I was just a bad boy, man. I mean, you know, I did all the the basic urban dweller type, you know, stuff. Uh, fortunately, I never got in trouble with the law, but uh, I think that was just God's grace protecting me. <laughs> but I was an urban dweller, man, and I, I grew up in public school. Uh, here's the thing that really made a, a difference for me, though. My father, even though he was a just a horrible alcoholic uh, during those times, uh, he came home every night. That kept me on the straight and narrow, so to speak, because Mom always threatened, look, you bring home some bad grades, you try to, you know, skip school or whatever, your daddy's going to know about it. And uh, and he did come home every night. We had to roll him up the stairs and down the stairs because he was, you know, falling over drunk in the hallway every night. I mean, he was horrible. So it's amazing that he's still living today and, and has a healthy liver because all of my formative years, all 18 years, he was every day a wretched drunk. So he's still living today. Uh, he and my mother are happily married 62 years. Wow. He's a mighty man of God. My mother is a mighty, mighty woman of God. She prayed him into the kingdom in his wretched state. Uh, so when I went to college, the whole drunk thing just went away. He never went to AA. Never. He, God just took the taste out of his mouth. It was just amazing. He's been a great example and mentor and following the Lord ever, ever since. So because he was there though, that influence is just so powerful for me. And it was, it was a great influence for me as well because it demonstrated to me what not to do. I tell fathers all the time when I go around the country, children don't need you in your, in your most perfect example. The reality is, is we as, as fallible human beings are not perfect in any way. It doesn't matter how, how perfect of an example we try to or present before people. It's important that we just live life before our children, because even in my father's wretched state, that was a great example for me. I, have, I don't begrudge any of it, because what it showed me is what not to do when I get married and have a family. You know, we have alcoholism that sort of runs through our family genealogy. And uh, so what it demonstrated for me is, look, don't mess with this stuff. This alcoholism, this thing can really destroy you and your progeny. So uh, we've had a pretty strict line throughout with starting with me, my son, I, you know, uh, discipled him and helped him to understand how not to be casual with alcohol, because it's, it does have a significant influence within our genealogy. So it was an example for me, even in his horrible state of what not to do, how to treat my wife, how to not get caught up in alcoholism, how not to do these things. And so it was very, 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 very valuable. And uh, I honor and respect my father for that. Not, mm -hmm. not, that, that. not that he was a drunk, but just the fact that he continued to come home and try to present whatever image he could, because it, it did help me. Uh, I stayed in school and actually got good grades, public school, so. And then I went to uh, San Jose State, got a sociology degree. So let's review. So I'm born in abject poverty, uh, a boy from the hood doing all the basic hood rat stuff. I mean, it was horrible in the sense that uh, I just loved to fight. I loved to scrap. You know, I mean, I'd take any covers, all comers, and I'd always finish it, you know. So I was steeped in liberalism, progressivism, urbanism, went to San Jose State and was steeped in Marxism because of sociology, you know, how these professors are, they teach you. So I get it. The Lord allowed me to live the arc of leftism, progressivism, urbanism, abject poverty, the entire gamut. When I go out and speak, you know, you'd be hard pressed to say, well, Kev, look, you had a silver spoon, man. You don't know what it's like. I know exactly what it's like. 
I got my sociology degree, met my lovely wife, now of 35 years, and she was a psychology major. And what we decided to do was really take God at his word. We were sort of secular Christians. You know, we took a lot of the, the grace for granted, right? So we were secular. We loved the Lord, but it wasn't, you know, we didn't take it that seriously. But what we decided to do is when we get married, look, we're going to take it seriously. Let's see if we can live strictly biblically most challenging but exhilarating thing we've ever done. I mean, it's, wow. And, you know, some people would say, well, yeah, of course, we all live strictly biblically. I, no, no, I don't think so. <laughs> but anyway, for us, that was what we decided to do. So we were being discipled in, in that. But what the Lord really showed us is, look, you've laid all these other domains, all these other areas at my altar. This one area of civic engagement, you didn't even give a second thought to. And so my wife and I looked at that together and we said, oh, my gosh, because we looked at the, the various platforms, libertarian, Democrat, Republican, and we thought all these years we've been sort of brainwashed into thinking uh, that our tradition is really what we need to embrace. We were doing ourselves and our community a disservice by blindly going into this thing. From that time, uh, we said, look, we're not going to vote based on ideological premises or traditions or any of that. I mean, we're going to vote strictly biblically. We're going to apply the word of God and let the chips fall where they're made. We don't have an axe to grind or a dog in the fight for politics, but we do want to stand virtuously and uh, completely and holistically for whatever God's word declares. And so from that time, which was uh, Reagan's second term, uh, we've always just voted and participated from a conservative perspective not because we're in love with a particular party or a particular ideology, but we're in love with the gospel and the Bible. And the Bible is, so we just kind of put the Bible in front of us to say, okay, which candidate lines up? From that, the Lord actually did something supernatural for me. He gave me a book to write. My first book was on the kingdom. So it was Lifestyle of the Rich and Kingdom. Uh, if you remember Lifestyle of the Rich and Famous, it's an offshoot of that, right? The theology of the kingdom is like rich. Miles Monroe, his kingdom book is <laughs> thick. Um, it, it, it was just an amazing transformation for me because it was all Holy Spirit led. You know, Holy Spirit woke me up. I tore my ACL working out. I was a black belt in martial arts. And uh, that Saturday I had tore my ACL, you know, playing around with these young boys and breaking them off. So the Lord woke me up that Sunday morning. He says, now that I have your attention. Now I heard this audibly inside. Now that I have your attention, I'm like, okay. He says, right. I'm thinking, I know what I'm hearing, but I don't know what to write. So I coyly opened up my laptop and I was like, okay. And my finger was just, uh, and it was all profound. I mean, this is deep kingdom revelation. And I'm like, OMG, this is, this is like amazing, right? And what the Lord taught me in that first book was, look, I am just looking for open, willing, and available vessels. I can do my own work. I don't need expert writers or profound intellectuals to do my writing. I just need a vessel that I can pour my stuff into and just release it to however I release it. I'm like, oh, that's how it works, huh? So that was my first book. And every book since then, I, I just finished my fifth, has been in that way. They've all been written within 10 weeks, profound, with research and everything. So when people ask me, well, how do you write? I say, look, I, I am not a writer. I'm just available to the spirit. At certain times, spirit want to do something. He does a download and it's a flow. It really is for me. Uh, writing, I think, is difficult, especially if you do it based on standard practice. Standard practice is you look at the subject you want to write it on, you look at what your chapter, your chapter layouts, what you want to convey in each chapter, how much research. I mean, it's it's comprehensive. It's terrible from my perspective because I don't like to work that way. But when I just avail myself to spirit, it's a flow and it's it's done, and uh, it's just amazing. So for the past 35 years, my wife and I have not taken the Holy Spirit for granted. We've, uh, we've honored, uh, tried in the best of our ability, tried to honor the word of God and do everything his way, because even if it doesn't make sense in the natural, 
uh, we find that he just he has his supernatural ways to to manifest whatever he wants to do. I want to interject something there because you've said so many rich things here. One, you talked about you don't see yourself as a necessarily a prolific writer. I, I've said that about myself. I've written quite a few books and I tell people I've never seen myself as a prolific writer, but I do know there's moments in time. I just want to lay out everything that I feel like the Lord's given to me. And I put it in kind of a, back in my first year of college uh, in a writing class, they actually said, just take all your thoughts and throw it up on the wall. There's no order to it. Just put your thoughts up there and then you cut and paste. And then you start getting some kind of direction. And really, that's what I've done. I've never considered myself a prolific writer nor an oratorically gifted communicator, but yet the Lord continues to allow those demands because something else you said is, and I believe, is that those who tell the story define the narrative and create the history. There are too many people telling stories that are based on their personal ideologies, philosophical bent, rather than coming through a biblical filter in a biblical worldview so it's important if we if we don't think we have a whole lot to say tell our story and what god is doing in our life and as we do that people can engage on a personal level of what they're not getting in other arenas when they read all kinds of materials out there they need to hear the spiritual context and journey in a biblical worldview uh, from those of us who have walk through some things and add our storyline into that. And so I appreciate you saying that because I, I feel the same way. What I found is that he took the zeal for me to fight, for me to be on top, always never walking away from, you know, conflict and, and all, all of that, just being, just wanting to do that. He took that and he says, look, I want to put you at the tip of the spirit culture. And I really feel that uh, what we're doing with every Black Life Matters what I'm now doing with Woked Up University, y'all Woked Up University, and all the things that it has me sort of involved in right if not right now at the moment, uh, we're going out and we are challenging culture. Uh, we're challenging clergy. Uh, we're challenging any and all comers. Uh, this is a time and a season where the remnant have been quiet long enough. We've been complacent. Uh, we've been spineless in many ways, in my opinion. Um, and I declared to the Lord probably 15 years ago, I said, look, I'm a fighter. You know, I'm a fighter. Send me, send me, I'll go, I'll, I'll take any and all. We've had several pastors over the decades who wanted to make us pastors. And the Lord always said, nope, do not. You. He says, I'm going to use you. And this is what he told me in my, my quiet times. The reason why I didn't want you to be a pastor is because I'm going to use you to challenge clergy. If you're in the hierarchy of pastor, then now you have to go to your senior pastor before you confront another pastor or a bishop or a doctor or be late or whatever. He says, I want you to be on the outside of that so you can challenge pastors without equivocation. And I didn't know how that was going to look. I was like, well, but now I'm in the middle of it. I mean, we go around any and everywhere. We're challenging clergy on James Cone, uh, you know, liberation theology, black liberation theology. We're changed, we're challenging clergy, any and all clergy on wokeism. And we're calling it what it is. It's demonism. It is trying to syncretize with culture. This is manifest demonism. And we have a lot of pastors that are letter, literally leading their parishioners to hell. I mean, I wish it were different, but I don't know how to say it. So I make videos. I do one minute shorts. Y'all woke up university on, on YouTube now. It's because of my latest book, I Woke Up, finally putting an ax to the taproot of white supremacy and racism in America. What we find in that book is all the false narratives that we're currently embroiled in are just that, false narratives. And that book really breaks apart any conversation about white christian nationalists or white supremacists not so in the least you know people are probably processing as they listen to this podcast that you've said things like every black life matters and they're used to hearing the narrative of something else and then you're yeah. talking about wokeism and you're talking about all these different things but what you're saying is you're filtering everything from your perspective in in a biblical worldview 
to filter everything through scripture rather than being, uh, you know, you said it early on in our conversation. I say that I'm not beholden to the party of the elephant or the party of the donkey. I'm beholden to the party of the lamb and the lion. And so uh, at the end of the day, we're not being pulled into any political party, but we feel like if we're Christians, we need to make sure that we are very honest uh, with ourselves and with the Lord through scripture to make sure that we're making an influence in all spheres of the culture, be it education, politics, whatever it is. We're not polluted by them, but we have to have an influence if we're going to influence the culture. Because I know you, and you have a lot of great pastor friends. You show great respect and honor to pastors, even in your disagreements. You have you have great civility in your public discourse, but you've probably gotten beat up a lot talking about, well, that's not the narrative. Well, so the narrative, what is it? The narrative should be God's word. So how, what got you into the position you're in now? Obviously, you've written the books, and you interface with a lot of pastors, and you minister in a lot of these settings, and you're also part of the Frederick Douglass uh, Institute and Foundation and in California as well as nationally. And you're not saying that there's not been issues historically, but, but there has been foundations laid by which we can move into an area of fixing cracked foundations and move into a place of health. So in one thing, you're not saying that it's all false. You're just saying that we have it. We should have a different narrative rather than the narrative the world is giving to us right now. Is that true? Yeah, that's true. What's interesting is uh, literally wokeism is built and rooted and in full embrace of white supremacy and racism. So the entire narrative about being woke and all of the people who would want to quantify themselves, including corporations, that are woke are literally, and this is not an, an anonymous because they they come at whites and, and, and Christians and evangelicals and they point the finger at us and they and so we're just pointing the finger back. No, this is not that. Literally, by definition, based on actual history and facts, wokeism as a movement is literally in full embrace and unequivocally and in full embrace of white supremacy and racism that they point the finger at others about. That was really revelatory for me. I had no idea where Holy Spirit was going to take me with this book when he says, I need you to write about wokeism. I'm going to go after it. I'm like, okay. But yes, was there, is there supremacy, white supremacy, racism? Absolutely. The narrative, though, is completely false. It's unbelievable. <laughs> you got to understand what's happened here. And I don't know if, it, if now is the time you want me to go a little bit into the book and sort of tell you what, what the revelation is on that. But uh, I can, if you like. But I want to set the tone. One is about your personal experience with the Lord that has given you the passion to do what you do. And because of the work of the cross and the power of the resurrection, you have as a person of color, been able to come through the optics of the cross and the relationship with Jesus Christ to yes. give you a different perspective. And so I'm always trying to encourage all my friends, I don't care if they're black, white, red, brown, or yellow, let, if we come to the cross together, there's something we have more in common than we have that divides us, but yes. we have to start at that place. Otherwise, we have nothing to build on. We're constantly going to be enemies, whereas Micah chapter 4 says that all people are welcome at the Mount of the Lord, but we need to put aside our weapons of warfare against each other now and turn them into harvesting tools together so the outcast, the lame, and the sick can become a strong nation. So uh, I see that we're listening to you. This is, this is kind of the journey you've been on as a person of color and predominantly being Black in America, that you've had to work through even things that were real, that you've been taught, even things that you lived out, and realities of history that brings you to a place at the cross that says, but here's the redemptive side. Everybody can talk about problems, but yeah. what are some solutions? And I, that's what I appreciate over the years listening to you and our conversations and that you've been able to work through some of those personal crucibles of experience uh, based even on history, but realizing that's not what we camp. We need to take those things we've learned and move to the future if we're going to be the church that God's called us to be to bring healing to the soul of a nation. So yeah, take Absolutely. us from that place to that process and Maybe some of the other titles of your other books as well. Now, let's get into for a moment your current book and what brought you to write that book. Those are great points. So here's the, the real 
essence of everybody who was on the Zoom call and or who will download it later and listen to it in the podcast. We are being divided and we're allowing ourselves, even within the body of Christ, to be divided. And what the Lord is asking of us all is, can you fully embrace the reconciliation that's already been done? Yes, racial reconciliation is important. And that's why Jesus did it. If you read Ephesians 2 and go from 14 to 22, you'll see exactly what he did. He broke down all barriers between male, female, Jew, Gentile, everything. Everybody on this call knows it. But we should really refamiliarize ourselves with that before we get caught up in, oh, man, we, we need racial reconciliation. Excuse me? No. We're not going to take Jesus's role. He's already done it. What we need to do is embrace what's been done. Embrace. That's a fact. So a lot of us forget what he did. And so we not only go from that point, we go then into condemnation. Right now, the number one condemnation is white Christian nationals or Christian nationals or evangelicals. If you're any of those, a half of the body of Christ thinks that you're to be put into this box of you're white supremacist, you're racist. And so we have condemnation going on within the church. And we forget again, Romans 8, 1, where God declares, look, there is no condemnation for any who are in Christ Jesus. If the God of the universe says, I am no longer going to condemn anyone who is in my son, how dare we actually think that we have the capacity, the audacity, the chutzpah, to now go in and start condemning one another in the body of Christ as, you know, nationalists or whatever we want to call it. This is offensive not only to me personally, but it's offensive to God. And we, we must repent for this. This is terrible what we're in right now. You know, I just wanted to get that up on the table because those are two things that are crystal clear that we must address so we can have a foundation for moving forward without the condemnation and without the whole, you know, we have to do more to reconcile with our brothers and that. Yeah, let's embrace the gospel. Let's fully embrace it. So with that, Zia, what the Lord did for me is he gave me the first book, Lifestyle of the Rich and Kingdom. The second book was uh, really, a, it was when Obama was coming into office. It was called Instanity, Instant Insanity. And it was a hybrid word, Instanity. And that book really addressed how we collectively, purposefully, and willingly went insane. And the insane moniker on that is doing the same thing over and over and over again, expecting a different result. So I literally use the definition of insanity. And what I was pointing to is we take these popular figures who have little or no capacity, no actual capacity haven't worked a job in their life, have no understanding of how to run a business, and we give them the keys to the kingdom of the entire United States. And so we went collectively insane, in my opinion, and I, I document in that book, why, with Obama and his years. The third book then was Just, Justly Justice, having me look intently at the social justice, racial justice, and human rights movements. And what is clear in that book is, first of all, we actually define what justice is and what it's not. And it's clear that all of these social justice, racial justice, human rights are not about justice at all. They're ideological, political movements and not at all about justice. So I kind of lay to the open what these movements are about. The fourth book then was The War on Women from the Root to the Fruit, Which Side Are You On? Um, that is actually going after culture. And it's nomenclature around the war on women. What is confirmed in that book, pivoting off Genesis 3.15, is that yes, indeed, there is a war. War on humanity via the woman, but it's a war on humanity. What the Lord really makes you know, plain in that book is how the spiritual warfare that we're in all the time, everything that started Genesis 3.15 from the rebellion of Eve and the serpent, when God declares there will be war between you, the serpent, and the woman and her offspring, and how that's actually played out over time. So I characterized the entire spiritual warfare that was unleashed, and then how that's literally played out historically, and then all the way up to today. And when you get to today, you'll see things like critical race theory, intersectionality, radical feminism, 
all of that is characterized because that's all still part of the Genesis 315 war. And then this latest one woke up was um, God saying, look, uh, I need you to really look intently at the woke movement and what that's based on. And so I said, okay, well, the woke movement is pretty much based on Marxism. I'll start with Marx. And I really felt the Lord say, no, no, that's not it. Marx literally had a mentor. Marx was someone's protege who was that person, start with that. So I went all the way back and I started with uh, the man who Marx and Engels gave all, dedicated all their early works to and dedicated all of their thinking to and acknowledged him as a mentor for their works. And that would be Charles Robert Darwin. When you look at Darwin's work, you see abject demonism in and out. It's unequivocal. With Darwin, uh, I'll give you an overview of what Darwin unleashed. And he literally unleashed it. Some people say, no, we've always, since the fall of man in the Garden of Eden. Yeah, I understand. Darwin literally unleashed in its modern context, white supremacy, racism, sexism and misogyny, atheism, mass genocide, and eugenics. One person, have we always had evil since the garden? Absolutely. Did we have slavery even when before Darwin even did his works? Absolutely. So some people would say, well, then how could you say that Darwin is literally the taproot, the one who unleashed it? We had these things being done, but they were opportunistic. They were individualized. When Darwin, who is a noted scientist worldwide, renowned, makes a proclamation like, you know, we have to protect our pure Aryan, Caucasian, European genealogy because we are the most resourceful and the most intellectual capable. Oh, and by the way, Blacks are apes, savages, gorillas, subhuman, actual quotes, actual quotes. Then you actually literally have the, an ontological and anthropological distinction being brought forth for white supremacy and an anthropological and scientific, if you will, ontological distinction for racism. He says, you know, you need to treat blacks differently. They're subhuman. They're still on the evolutionary scale. That was the first time in human history that a noted scientist made those distinctions. We have to remember slavery was all opportunistic based on economics. That's how it happened. They said, look, free labor? Yeah, come. I need to grow these crops here. And, you know, some Southern Democrats said, yeah, yeah, bring them here. And, and so we had the Europeans negotiating with African slave owners. If you haven't seen a Woman King, brand new movie by Viola Davis, wonderful, wonderful movie. No cursing, no sex, nothing. Brand new, it's just out. Woman King, it characterizes exactly what happened. Uh, mm -hmm. In our thought, we were raised to think that, hey, um, you know, Americans and Europeans went over there and raided Africa. Not true at all. It was Africans, warlords, who were actually literally selling other Africans from other tribes that they captured to Europeans. So that's how it happened. It was Africans. That was an economic opportunity, and it was opportunistic. There was no distinction of these people weren't even human until Darwin said, no, blacks are subhuman. They're apes. They're savages. They're low on the evolutionary scale. Remember, I, Darwin, said we have evolution. Look at these people. It was then that we inculcated white supremacy. So, Kevin, hold, hold that thought for a second, because, yeah. wow. So why then, when we're talking about Darwinism and the Pandora's box that was open to legitimizing racism and slavery, yeah. and then you look at even pro-life versus those who are abortionists, and how we've embraced Darwinism in a woke culture, how they can still embrace Darwinism and embrace Margaret Sanger, who would say the same things about people of color, predominantly uh, Black Americans, 
and it was really population control. So how then have we taken those, got woke about that, the very foundations of these things, rather than embracing them, even in a culture where we should look at the root and, you know, Jesus said, go to the root, take it out of the root. You know, you have to go take the root to, to the X to the root. It's a dichotomy of thought because yeah. people still embrace the very things by which they're trying to say we have these problems, but they're not going to taking the ax to the root. Exactly. That you, you've characterized our quandary right here, Doug. That's exactly right. So we have these people hysterical and shrill about what's happening. You know, when we have the Dobbs decision, you would think the entire body of Christ would be able to rally around that. No, not so. It's been muted. It's in, especially in black church, you're like, you know, I don't know about this. Excuse me? Anyway, here's the, here's the thing. Uh, I'll give you a little bit more context about what exactly what you're talking to, what you're pointing to with Sanger and all of that. Darwin and his first cousin, Francis Galton, are the fathers of eugenics. Now, mm. some people would say, oh, wow, eugenics is evil. How did it come about? Here's the thing. They literally came about because they were paranoid about their white supremacy. So a lot of people don't know to what level Darwin was a supremacist. Let me characterize where Darwin, how he really, how it played out. He was such a supremacist and wanted to protect his pure genealogy so much that he married his first cousin. Now he knew that there would potentially be you know, with their children, there could potentially be some issues because he studied it, he, he understood, but he wanted to protect his intellectual capacity within his family's bloodline and within his, because he really felt that, hey, we're supreme, we're, you know, we got to protect him. So he had 10 kids, seven of which were fine, three had issues because of heredity and genetics. So he was a real supremacist. His cousin who influenced him, which a lot of people aren't aware of, was Thomas Malthus. Malthus as well was a paranoid, radical environmentalist. Malthus took a look at ethnicities around the world and he says, man, I tell you what, you know, these other ethnicities are really growing in population. They're overpopulating much more than, than we whites and we need to figure out a way to do something about it. So Malthus as well married his first cousin because he, again, wanted to protect his pure genealogical presence. So his younger cousin, Charles Darwin, actually went in cahoots with his younger cousin, Francis Galton. And he and Francis said, look, we need to come up with a scientific justification for racial extermination. So they started eugenics. Eugenics literally means well-born, okay? So they said anybody that's not well-born can summarily be exterminated. And the way it played out was Hitler, Stalin, Lenin, Mao, Pol Pot, all of them, and I have the connections in this book, all of them pointed to Darwin when they were doing their atrocious, demonic, mass genocide of their own people. They pointed to Darwin. They said, oh, no, it's fine. Darwin already said, you know, these people are not well born. We can, we can, it's fine, no problem. Darwin, here's the point. Abortion in and of itself is literally a white supremacist racist plot. And it's unequivocal. It's unequivocal. The reason why we had it, the reason why it was concocted is because they didn't want these other ethnicities to overpopulate and take over supremacy of Caucasians at the time. European Caucasian. That's why they started it. It's an inconvenient truth, but it's the truth. So anybody that embraces abortion, I call them flat out. You can, it's fine. You, you can embrace abortion if you want after I gave you the story. It's fine that you do that. Now just own it. Say, go around and say, look, I'm a white supremacist and a racist because I'm embracing abortion. There's no other way to characterize it. I wish it was different. There's no other way to characterize it, folks. So the if you embrace abortion today, unequivocally, you are a supremacist and a racist. And that's why you started also not just working with the 
Frederick Douglass Foundation in civil righteousness, but also started Every Black Life Matters because the majority of children that have been placed on the altar of convenience, and look, our yeah. hearts have compassion for women who have had abortions to minister to them and so on. So because people try to make this into a, a man against woman issue or and these other things, but I'm just looking at any society that finds the need to discard their children born or unborn, tells me that we have some real root issues and problems. So we address with compassion those who have, but we also need to address the root issues again, as you've been talking about. The majority of those who have been aborted in America, for example, if you'll address this for a moment, have been primarily people of color, yeah. targeted as well, because it goes back again to the root fundamentals of why it even exists. And right. where the Pandora's box is open. Address that right. for me. So the way that uh, the eugenics movement actually, you know, took captivated all of the globe was with these atrocious mass genocides of despots, right? The the despots doing it. And then when it came to America, we had Margaret Sanger, who was a eugenicist. Actually, a, a lot of eugenics was actually started here in America, and then it was kind of, you know, adopted and and that. But Margaret Sanger, um, she and there was, there was a Margaret Sanger and Hitler connection at some point, correct? Absolutely, there was. She was a supporter, a friend, if you will, of a lot of the mass genocide going on at the time, including a friend of Hitler's. She was a frequent speaker at the Women's KKK. Uh, she actually supported full sterilization of blacks. She mm -hmm. started her family planning clinics, which are now. Planned Parenthood. And, you know, she says, look, we don't want the word to get out. This is when she was talking to the heir of the Procter and Gamble enterprise. Uh, she was talking to Gamble. She said, we don't want the word to get out, but we want to fully exterminate the Negro population. This is Margaret Sanger's exactly. So uh, she started not women's, you know, not because of women's screenings or women's health care. No, no, no. She started Planned Parenthood to exterminate Blacks. That's that's a fact. Now, she realized she couldn't hang out her, her advertisement or shingle and say, look, exterminate Blacks here. That would be ridiculous. So she said, we have to round off our services with screenings and this and that. But ideally, we're here because we need to exterminate Blacks. So she fully adopted the Darwinistic, Marxist, uh, eugenics-based you know, ideology. And she proliferated. And to this very day, uh, up to 90% of all Planned Parenthoods are within walking distance, Black community, Black and Brown community. So some people would say, well, no, they've, they've actually renounced Sanger and they've changed their ways. No, they haven't. Hmm. Here's the thing. If they would have changed their ways, uh, this is how it would look. We have areas where women congregate. That would be Walmart and Target. So if Planned Parenthood just wanted to be available for all women, any women, uh, they would partner, put a Planned Parenthood on the backside of every Walmart and Target in the country, because that's, those are frequented by, by women generally. Um, but they haven't done that. They, they keep it within walking distance of the Black community. And what that means for Blacks is that right now, we would have double the number of Blacks alive today, double, if we were not targeted by eugenics and by Margaret Say. Mm -hmm. So it has disempowered us. We have virtually eliminated, you know, big part of, of, of this minority. And we still hear the screams and the shrill hysterics of people who want more. And it's it's terrible. It's a travesty. Um, it is something that that clergy cannot, should not, you know, embrace at any, in any level, this is atrocious to God and to humanity. I know we talked about this before. There is a, a, a film that is well worth the watch called Mahapa 21. Oh. And, and that helps to kind of lay the foundation of all these connections as well. But tell us a little bit about your current book, because you address some of these issues and you filter everything through your journey in your biblical understanding as a Christian first and recognizing the atrocities of the past, but realizing we have to build on what the Lord wants, as you said, embrace the gospel 
embrace God, embrace Jesus, and then we can find a place of healing. If we build anything else, it will not last. And we've seen already the the crack foundations of some of these things from Marxism and and through Darwin and through Margaret Sanger. In fact, you know, you were saying they they said they've distanced themselves, but why do then they keep giving out uh, these large uh, awards called the Margaret Sanger Award? You know, if it was in in the culture of today, anybody who had just a one percent of a hundred percent of things they did any association they'd be eliminated in the culture even taken off social media taken off of everything else if they had even an inkling of connection but yet Absolutely. when it comes to that ideology it's justified rather than looking at truth and loving truth more than their own personal preferences so uh, tell us a little bit about what you address in your book and announce that book and how they can get it and also how to get connected with you. The book is called Wokta. The subtitle is Finally Putting an Axe to the Taproot of White Supremacy and Racism in America. Now, the whole point of it was, you know, really trying to figure out what's this deal about wokeism? Why are they always pointing fingers, castigating and demonizing and condemning anybody that has a dissenting voice? Um, and so I, I took a look at it. I told you what happened, how the, I really felt the spirit led me to look at it. What's really illuminated throughout the book, and again, chapter, verse, private letters, everything is fully documented. The footnotes are exhaustive. So you now have everything you need uh, to begin to bring your woke friends, family, children, grandchildren along to help them understand the truth. The takeaway is, is that everything that the woke movement is built on is literally white supremacist and racism. And that's amazing. So even Bill Federer, when he read it, and he wrote the endorsement for it, he's like, Kevin, this is unbelievable. Now, Bill Federer, you know him. And I know most of you know him. He's frequent at, at Grace Woodlands and that. But, uh, and he's just a mighty man of God historian. Uh, he's written extensively about both Marx and Darwin but he's never, according to him, he's like, I never saw the connections. The connections you make in this book are profound, life altering. So it's, and it's not me. I wish I could take credit. Hey, yeah, I'm smarter than Bill Federer. No. It's Holy Spirit who kind of led me. Um, what's there is just incredible. It literally turns the entire woke movement on its head. And because it, it, it properly characterizes all of the malfeasance, false narratives, how they were invented, why? Uh, and it lays it at the feet, not at conservatives or whites, or lays it at the feet of Darwin, Marx, current context, Saul Alinsky. So I take the entire stream and kind of let you see how this is how it is. But, you know, it also provides solutions. So at the end of it, what, what we talk about is, look, okay, we have a lot of friends and family that are what Lenin called, what Lenin called useful idiots. And the reason why, that's not a disparaging, by the way. It's, you know, what Lenin said is, look, we have a lot of people that will forestall or forego their moral bearings, their principles, their ethics personally, their personal integrity, and will go all in with culture. And they will help us. These are people that are useful idiots. In other words, they're just sucked in, they're gripped into cold, and they have no idea why they're woke. You know, they don't have any bad intentions. They're just kind of caught up. But this book helps us because now we could say to those people that are non-ideological, if they're, if they're grotesquely ideological, don't waste time. I mean, they're not going to come. But, but if there's a lot, majority of the woke movement are non-ideological. They just, they think that it's cool to, and hip to be woke. But when you start to expose them to the roots of this, they'll walk away from it if they're not ideological. And so this book gives you all the ammunition you need to bring people along and help them. And so we actually provide, we say, look, racism and white supremacy is alive and well today, primarily because of the foundations of it, which is taught in all schools, foundations being Darwinism, and all schools from K to 16. So since it's so infused in our curriculum, it's there. And, and, and so we all have to be deprogrammed to a certain extent. But here's the deal. We say, look, we need to, if we're going to be sincere about getting rid of all the accoutrements of racism and white supremacy, 
we need to go to the roots of it. We need to fully expose the root and we need to uh, fully demolish it. Now, in the construction terms, if you look at structures and buildings, when you do that, it's called raising, R-A-Z-E. So we need to raise racism. And it's explained in the book. So our path at Every Black Life Matters, we've just launched it, is we're going to go out and we're going to raise racism from its roots and foundation, completely demolish it, utterly destroy the foundations, which means we're going to expose Marx, we're going to expose Darwin, and we're going to stand against them wherever any of those mindsets are, in our workplaces, in our homes, in our schools. That's how we'll start to get rid of racism. Well, you mentioned now, leftists will tell you, I'm in full embrace of Marxism. How could you tell me that he's a racist? Read the book. No. Marxism was a horrible racist. Horrible. You, you mentioned uh, Solowinsky as well. And I, yeah. I know people have heard that quote, but much of what's happening in what we've seen in the unraveling of our culture has been based out of his book, which originally, I think they've taken it out, but originally was dedicated to Lucifer. Yeah. And uh, so it's being taught in our universities. It's been taught how to do community uh, outreaches and, and development. Yeah. But it's not about the, the social justice side. It's really about, uh, about unraveling and changing people's mindsets to believe something. Because you say it enough times, they begin to believe it. And we've yeah. seen that from Disney to Hollywood, you name it. The more that it's bombarded, it becomes, by repetition, something we just take for granted and we believe. So do you address some of those things as well in your books and your writings? Absolutely. All of it is thoroughly addressed, including Saul Linsky and, and his dedication of his book to, to Lucifer, the most, the, the first radical is what he calls it. So all of the, those connections are there. Uh, here's what I'd like to leave people with. There is a, a real solution to any of the racism that's going on. The roots of it, we have to get to. We can't continue to allow these anti-racist consultants to go out and then uh, have this sort of nebulous idea of racism that's not even accurate. And while they're rooted in Marxism themselves, which means that they're racist themselves and trying to teach others how to overcome racism, it's just foolery, it's ridiculous. But number two is they're layering on now additional definitions. So now they've layered on trans. If you're transphobic or you're not embracing of trans, guess what, you're a white supremacist and a racist. Then they've layered on environmentalism. If you're not a radical environmentalist, guess what? You're a white supremacist. I mean, it's ridiculous. We need to get to the root, and that's what we do. So we're offering uh, what we call raises training, and we want to build a generation of hell raisers, R-A-Z-E-R-S, where literally uh, we certify people. The first foray will be in uh, at the Awakened Church, one of the large mega churches in San Diego. Jim Garlow's church that he handed off to Pastor Jurgen will be there the end of October and literally want to train and certify October 29th, whoever comes. It's not ideological. It's not a political stance we're taking. This is looking intently at the issues of racism and white supremacy, doing something about it, raising it. And so we'll be certifying people on that day. If you're in San Diego, wonderful. Glad to have you. We'll certify you for whatever modules you stand, uh, stay for, stay for the whole day. You'll be certified as a hell raiser. Tell us how people can connect with you. Do you have contact information or website that yep. they can connect? And that way they can look Wonderful. at some of your books as well. So if you just go to our website, everyblm.com, everyblm.com, you'll get access to potentially the book. You'll get our upcoming events, you know, including this training that we're doing in San Diego for free. And, uh, and so you get all of that. If you just want the book, if, if you've decided, hey, that book sounds like it's interesting. I really just need to have that so I can get some ammunition and talk my friends and family through that. Just go to Amazon. Just go to Amazon, type in woke up, W-O-K-E-D up, uh, McGarry, M-C-G-A-R-Y. It'll come up. Just order it. Have five stars. All reviews are just fantastic. Uh, and order it from Amazon. Last thing, please go to my Y'all Woke Up YouTube, Y'all Woke Up University. I'm a master class practitioner and professor and doctor of, of y'all woke up it's my own thing but what i'm giving you are one minute shorts on current events and news and then also i have a few long form things i do there 
But if you go there, you'll get you know all my sort of uh, ruminations about what's happening day to day in America in a non woke format. So, well, Father, I thank you so much for just allowing us this opportunity to hear from Kevin to hear about the extensive, passionate research as well as unraveling the things that have been so integrated in our culture to go back to put the axe to the root. God, we all would recognize that we hate what you hate and we yeah. despise racism. We despise yeah. you know, the killing of any life and we despise these things and we would all, majority would agree with them. Yet, Lord, we've approached it in a way that has no answers until we go to the root. So I yes. thank you, Father, that in this conversation today, it has given us some tools by which to process, to think, to be provoked. And I pray, Lord, that you would give uh, Kevin continued clarity, prophetic clarity and wisdom, direction, favor and opportunity, Lord, to have a civil dialogue in his discourse with those who would even strongly disagree with him. But Lord, would you let the truth be the truth and be the very North Star, the, the true North that we would all, we've been talking about, the true North that we would all recognize that with truth, we can all be free and we can yes. be liberated in Jesus' name. Amen.